I'm Kim, and I'm so glad that you're here today. We're going to worship together shortly, but before we do, let me share some announcements with you. Happy Labor Day weekend. We hope you have a fun weekend, and as a reminder, the church office will be closed Monday, September 5th to observe the holiday. Men, on September 18th, we will have a golf outing to Top Golf in Eastridge. The cost will be $20, and food will be on your own. We need to know if you wish to attend by Wednesday, September 7th, so we can make reservations. Please register in the church app or by calling the church office. Don't forget that Thursdays at 6 p.m., we have a grief share class in the fellowship hall. This is for anyone who needs support following the loss of a loved one. It could be a recent loss or one from years ago that you're trying to work through, but we would love to support you in your grief. The cost is $10, and you can sign up now at lafayettefirst.life or by calling the church office. Ladies, make plans to be part of our next craft day. Join us this Saturday, September 10th, from 10 to noon in the Fellowship Hall. 
will be making some fall home decor and Tammy Chandler will be sharing her story of God working in her life. The cost is $10 and you can sign up now in the Church Center app. Don't forget to bring your jar. On Saturday, September 17th, there's a fun event planned for mothers and sons. Listen to this announcement from the Pirate Pastor. Yar! Ahoy, mateys! This be the Pirate Pastor, Derek the Ball. I'm here to tell ye about a dashing event for moms and their sons. On the year of our Lord, September 17th, at 10 o'clock in the morning, mothers and their boys will be gathering at the church house for a pirate party where you'll be searching for sunken treasure and learning how God has designed this special relationship to help young men grow into Christ-like men. Be sure to come out and enjoy the swashbuckling fun. Finally, Lafayette First is holding a marriage retreat on September 23rd and 24th in Blue Ridge, Georgia. We welcome family and marriage counselor Judy Holly as our guest speaker. The cost is $279 per couple, and that includes your hotel, breakfast on Saturday, and the conference materials. The deadline to sign up is today, Sunday, September 4th, and space is running out, so act quickly to be part of this great weekend. We would love to see you be part of all these upcoming events. Remember how vital community is for our growth in Christ. We're so glad that you're here today. Take a moment to pray and get ready to meet with God as we worship together. God who cares for me. You are a God who cares for me. I know there's nothing I could do, Lord, that would make you love me more. Bless my life now, make me stronger. I know there's so much that's in store. Your mercy's raining down, and I stand amazed. You call my name, and I'm lost in your gaze. Mercy's raining down, and everywhere I see, you are a God who cares for me. God who cares for me.
everyone, I'm Kim, and I'm so glad that you're here today. We're going to worship together shortly, but before we do, let me share some announcements with you. Happy Labor Day weekend. We hope you have a fun weekend, and as a reminder, the church office will be closed Monday, September 5th to observe the holiday. Men, on September 18th, we will have a golf outing to Top Golf in Eastridge. The cost will be $20 and food will be on your own. We need to know if you wish to attend by Wednesday, September 7th, so we can make reservations. Please register in the church app or by calling the church office. Don't forget that Thursdays at 6 p.m., we have a grief share class in the fellowship hall. This is for anyone who needs support following the loss of a loved one. It could be a recent loss or one from years ago that you're trying to work through, but we would love to support you in your grief. The cost is $10 and you can sign up now at lafayettefirst.life or by calling the church office. Ladies, make plans to be part of our next craft day. Join us this Saturday, September 10th from 10 to noon in the Fellowship Hall. We'll be making some fall home decor and Tammy Chandler will be sharing her story of God working in her life. The cost is $10 and you can sign up now in the Church Center app. Don't forget to bring your jar. On Saturday, September 17th, there's a fun event planned for mothers and sons. Listen to this announcement from the Pirate Pastor. Yar! Ahoy, mateys! This be the Pirate Pastor, Derek the Ball. I'm here to tell ye about a dashing event for moms and their sons. On the year of our Lord, September 17th, at 10 o'clock in the morning, mothers and their boys will be gathering at the church house for a pirate party where you'll be searching for sunken treasure and learning how God has designed this special relationship to help young men grow into Christ-like men. Be sure to come out and enjoy the swashbuckling fun. Finally, Lafayette First is holding a marriage retreat on September 23rd and 24th in Blue Ridge, Georgia. We welcome family and marriage counselor Judy Holly as our guest speaker. The cost is $279 per couple and that includes your hotel, breakfast on Saturday, and the conference materials. The deadline to sign up is today, Sunday, September 4th, and space is running out, so act quickly to be part of this great weekend. We would love to see you be part of all these upcoming events. Remember how vital community is for our growth in Christ. We're so glad that you're here today. Take a moment to pray and get ready to meet with God as we worship together. And he's touching me. Oh, he's touching me. And there's power in his hand. Welcome, everybody. So glad that you're here today. Let's stand to our feet after that rousing countdown. Thank God that we're here this morning on a wet, wet Sunday morning. And we're going to worship. I hope you came ready to lift up your voice to the Lord, okay? Let's do that together. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? in his grace this hour are you washed in the blood of the lamb are you washed in the blood in the soul cleansing blood of the lamb are your garments spotless are they white as snow are you washed in the blood Savior's side, are you washed in the blood? 
us. We find rest and trust in him. Let's continue to worship this morning, knowing that our God can do more than we can think or imagine. Amen. Knowing that God can do more than we think or imagine. Amen. There we go. There we go. Wake up. I know it's rainy outside, but it's sunny in here. Amen. Let's continue to worship together. Just one word. Storm that surrounds me. Just one word, the darkness has to retreat. Just one touch, I feel the presence of heaven. Just one touch, my eyes are open to see. My heart can't help but be. There's nothing that our God can do. There's not a mountain that He can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can do. Just one word, you heal what's broken inside me. Just one word.
this morning? Our God is incredible. Well, this morning, have a seat. Have a seat. We have, again, the incredible opportunity to see new life in Christ. So if you would, direct your attention to the screens for just a moment. We're going to celebrate baptism together. Hi, my name is Devin Harvey, and my story is that a couple years ago, I got out on drugs, and I'm a recovering drug addict, eight months sober now. I had gotten saved when I went to jail of Silverdale two months ago, and I wanted to follow up with a baptism and find my a home church. I'm thankful for my children. They're a big part of my life. Um, they're big church-going children. They love church. My son especially loves this church. He's came once. He'll be here this Sunday to celebrate with me, and I'm thankful that they are able to come out and celebrate this day with me. My children are my world, and that's who made me want to clean up my life and get back going to church and bring Christ back in my heart. I'm thankful for Brandon. He's He's my backbone in this. He's been helping me through a lot, and I'm thankful for him a lot. And I'm thankful for being baptized today, and I'm ready to see the works that God's got in front of me, what he's going, or how he's going to work through me. Amen. You know, we just sang that song, and I hope you pay attention to the words, and it says, there's nothing that our God can't do, and it says he's moving mountains. Do you believe that? Yes. yes. He is moving mountains, and he's moving mountains in Devin's life. God has saved her, and she is ready. She's just excited. She's like up here just about to cry. About to sh you know, She's just nerv nervous with excitement. And so uh, we want to ask some folks who are here with her, uh, her own family, to stand. Uh, but we also want to ask those folks in her connect group, uh, the SALT connect group, if you would stand with her as well and on her behalf. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Devin, have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes. And I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, burying you in the likeness of his baptism, raising you to life in him. <laughs> God is so good that he works and moves and literally does move mountains for us. And we're so glad that you're here this morning to experience it with us. We want to welcome you. We're so glad that you're here. If you are a guest this morning, we would love to let you know about all the things that are happening here at Lafayette First. You can fill out a Connect card right in front of you there in the pew. It shouldn't be too far from you. Or if you'd rather do that digitally, you can text the word GUEST to 423-455-9458. Uh, and that would just give you a digital version of the same Connect card that's right there in front of you. But we would love uh, to, to let you know about what's happening here at Lafayette First and how you can get involved in this incredible kind of life change that's happening here in our midst. It's so exciting to see God at work. Well, let's stand to our feet. And let's continue to worship this morning. You know, Devin has experienced, and many of us in this room have experienced, the incredible saving power of the blood of Jesus Christ. And let's celebrate that this morning, uh, knowing that there is nothing else that can wash away our sin but the blood of Jesus Christ. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. This 
have a seat but continue to worship with us this morning
almost did it again. All right. Turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 9, if you would, please. Can I just say I'm amazed at what God is doing and how he's working? I, uh, it looks better if that thing is closed, but I hope it just stays open. I went, I recently heard of a church that their baptistry has a screen like those placed on the front of it. You know why? They don't use the baptistry. And I pray that doesn't happen here. More people could say amen to that if they wanted to. There we go. You don't have to, but. So I got a couple of just uh, housekeeping, a, little, a, a few things coming up. I just want to let you know about it's really one primary thing, and that is September 18th is Back to Church Sunday, and uh, it's a national day. Uh, it's kind of, you know, people, unfortunately, you know, it's just how the light world works. During the summer months, folks, are, you're, you're taking vacations and stuff, and so everybody's not here. So the idea is like, let's all come back. It's fall. Everything's kicking off. Uh, you know, like... Uh, Georgia football, stuff like that, you know. <laughs> Go dogs, right? And um, so Back to Church Sunday is September 18th. And so we invite you to take some of these. There's going to be some up here at the end of the service, and there's some back at my table with me. Come and grab at least one, but multiples, and invite somebody to church on the 18th. You can invite them next week too, but invite them definitely on the 18th. And um, with that, we are trying to just, uh, um, we're just trying to increase our first impressions team a little bit to get ready for that day. And so next week, if you're interested in helping with our first impressions team, and that just means you're opening doors, you're greeting folks with a smile, you are making a good first impression. That's why we call it that. Uh, we would like to increase that for that Sunday, and so we're going to meet briefly in the chapel next week right after service. And so if you're interested in helping in that way, please come, and we want to help you get plugged in with that. Also with Back to Church Sunday and following, we are going to start a new Belong class. Belong is our class to help people to find that inroad to figure out how they can discover uh, how to love, live, and lead here at Lafayette First. That's our um, mission and vision, and we want to help you plug into that. So things like finding a connect group, finding an area of service based on how God has shaped you, and learning what it means to be a part of this church. That's going to be September 25th, so the week after so that if we do have guests on the 18th, we can invite them to be a part of that. Some of you already received a handwritten invitation to that, but we want to make sure everyone knows about that. And just to kind of let you know what that's like and how it's helped others in the past, I want to show a real quick video to you about Belong Class, and then we'll jump into Revelation chapter 9. So watch this video for just a moment, and then we'll jump into our scripture today. Hi, I'm Crystal Domzik. Uh, my family moved here from Watertown, New York uh, back in August. Hey, we're the Anglins and we've been coming for quite a while now and First Baptist feels like our home. Um, ended up hearing a lot of re references to um, First Baptist in Lafayette, so I decided to try it out. Um, came to a couple of services. Everybody was super friendly um, right from coming through the front door all the way up through service. People that I didn't know stopped and wanted to know my story even after service when I was, you know, a brand new face. It was a really warm, welcoming experience. This morning on our way to church, we were going down the driveway and Weston, our five-year-old, said, Mommy, I just really like going to church. And you know, as a parent to hear that your child is going to church and isn't like, oh, I'm gonna go to church, looks forward to going to church on Sundays is you know that that's, great. that's a good feeling. I decided that I wanted to become a member um, and at that point I found out about the new member classes that they were offering so I decided to go ahead and sit in on a couple and um, see what membership was all about here and it was a really um, 
good process to go through, uh, even down to figuring out what our uh, fruit of the spirit is and our talents and our gifts, um, things that I've never really explored in additional churches. Um, just help me connect a little bit more with where the Lord might be leading me to serve. I enjoyed the Blown class because it's, you know, it was, it's like an icebreaker. You, you, you can come and sit on the pew and just like, I really don't know what, what to do. And it's like, okay, here's a Blown class I can go to it's it's getting your foot in the door it's breaking the ice you know if you have questions like i don't really know how to join i want to join i don't like to sit on the pew but i want to do something what do i do okay let's go to the blown class and figure it out we met people that we didn't know before also in the blown class who we've really enjoyed getting to know i always make sure i wave at them special because you feel like part of, you know, your own little group that you met in your belong class, and, um, you know, it really did make you feel like it got you started with getting involved with the church. We did a gift, like a spiritual gift um, guideline that kind of helped you to know where you might fit in best to help. It's been a great experience, and I'd say if the Lord is really leading you, and the Lord is talking to you, and, and this is where you want to be, I would definitely jump into the new membership kind of classes, um, and just see where God plugs you in from there. Yeah, we want to just invite you to be there. That's September 25th. It's in the music suite, uh, the choir room, at 10 a.m. during Sunday school. And so if you are new and would like to learn more about our church and getting connected in those ways, let us know. Let's jump into Revelation chapter 9. And today we're looking at one of three woes, W-O-E, a, a woe. So I, I, I think it's helpful for us to understand what does that mean? What, is, what has that been biblically? What is a woe from a biblical standpoint? Not just here in Revelation, but throughout the entire uh, Bible. What, what does that word mean? And there's really nothing that special about the actual word in the original language. The word really is just a transitional type of word, a transitional statement. It's similar to alas, like look, look at that thing, look at this thing. And I would even say, in, in a sense, it seems like it's kind of, uh, biblically, one of those things that's just kind of a sigh, or maybe even a grunt, like an inaudible grunt, like this just sigh of, oh my goodness, you know? Uh, it's certainly a warning, and we've talked about that. These trumpet blasts in chapter uh, 8 and chapter 9 are warnings. They're a warning shot, a warning sound to let us know that a judgment is coming. Uh, something is coming that we need to be aware of and be prepared for and be uh, cognizant of so that we don't fall into uh, uh, what that judgment brings on us, that we can turn and change our lives and do something different and repent and be different. But it's that sigh or grunt, uh, this, ugh, you know, just, oh my goodness. I, I'm reminded of Isaiah, in Isaiah, when, in chapter 6, when he's met with the, the sheer vision of God. It's uh, Isaiah chapter 6, and it says, The glory of the Lord filled the temple, right? So the glory of the Lord is surrounding this man, and he just says, Oh my goodness. He says, Woe to me. And so what he's saying is like, Oh my goodness. I'm in a wrong place. Where, I, where am I? It's this... This grunt, this, oh, this, oh my goodness. And he realizes in that moment, placed in juxtaposition of to who God is and who he is, he realizes he's holy and I'm not. He's holy and I am unclean. And so he says, oh God, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. And that's what's happening here in Revelation 9. We are met with the, the sheer magnitude and glory and honor and uh, God in all his glory. 
in all of his holiness, in all of his righteousness, in all of his transcendence. And the same thing is true. Oh my goodness, who is this God? You see, we, we sometimes make God too familiar. Now, I don't want to confuse us because we oftentimes deal in polarities, right? Our, our, our lives and the things in our life swing from one, pendulum, uh, one side of the pendulum to the other. And then oftentimes with who God is, it's paradoxical to us. It doesn't seem to line up or be able to fit together at the same time. And so, yes, God is transcendent and high in all of his glory, yet he is near and approachable and close. But we err. We make mistakes if all we ever focus on is how loving and soft and kind and all these things about God and not hold up at the very same time the tension of the fact that He is holy, mighty, glorious, creator and deserving of all honor, glory, and praise. He is both of those at the same time. Now, I will say sometimes we focus too much or some of us focus too much also on his transcendence and holiness and judgment and wrath and fail to realize, no, he is gracious and kind and loving. And one of the things I've tried to do this entire series is to hold both of those up to the same level at all times because in the nature of God, the character of God, they don't vary. They don't wane. One doesn't wane while the other comes up. It, they are balanced completely at all times. But we err if we only focus on one or the other. Even Jesus himself in the New Testament smoke, spoke woes. These woes, these, these, these transitional alas statements, these warning statements over several towns telling them, they would have a worse judgment than Sodom and Gomorrah in other places because of their unrepentant hearts. And that's what, what this comes down to. This is not the judgment of God against innocent bystanders. This is the judgment of God against a kingdom that rails against him day in and day night, day, uh, day in and day in I lost the saying. All the time. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> this is the judgment of God being placed on people that have been given opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to trust in Him, to believe in Him, and yet continue in their unrepentant nature, living for themselves and themselves only. What we see in a woe is a moment that was inevitably coming because of a pattern of disobedience. We should not be surprised that this is the end result of constant disobedience and constant uh, railing against God in this kingdom of this world and its ruler of, uh, of this earthly kingdom, namely Satan. We shouldn't be surprised that this is the end result. This is the thing that would come at the end of all this. We shouldn't be surprised by that. It's inevitable. And I want to try to put this on a level that I certainly understand, and I hope maybe it will help you as well. Uh, I have four children, in case anyone didn't know that. Uh, I talk about it a lot, so you probably do. And being a parent is challenging. Being a parent to four children is, is challenging. And uh, uh, particularly uh, as they get older, I'm finding it's just harder. I take them back to babies. They're, you know, I held my little nephew yesterday, and I just said, goo goo ga ga, and he laughed at me. And it was awesome. There was no back talk. There was no <laughs> bad behavior, right? He's just like a few months old, and he just giggled. And it was fun. And it's like, oh, man, maybe we should just go back to that and just stay there. It gets harder. It gets harder because new challenges arise. And the thing is, is with parenting, I find myself 
constantly warning, don't do that or there will be a consequence. Don't do that or there will be a consequence. Don't do that. I'm going to have to do something. And I'm this kind of guy that wants to give you all the opportunities available. But yet, they don't listen. (laughs) And so I get to this moment where it's this grunt of, oh my goodness, I have to do what I said I would do, or they'll just run over me, right? And so it gets to that moment where I say, well, you have disobeyed again and again and again, and I gave you every chance, every chance to correct the behavior, and you didn't. And so now I have to do what I said I would do. We understand it in that context because we realize those little books, and eventually we get to that point where it's like, you get over here, we're getting, you know, it's not as like, oh man, I have to, it's like, you get over here, you know. (laughs) Maybe that's just me, maybe you have no idea what I'm talking about. By your laughter, I think you probably do. And in a way, that is not, not to minimize God and his character to our level, but it's a, a human example to help us see what's happening with him and his judgment. He's given every opportunity, and yet disobedience continues, unrepentance continues. And we get to this point that is inevitable. It's inevitable. A woe isn't something God only reserves for the the wretched kingdom of this world either and the ones who bow down to the feet of its king, but even his own followers in Isaiah chapter 3, 1 through 11. I want to read this because I want you to see this idea of unrepentance that leads God to act in this way. Isaiah chapter 3, 1 through 11. It's going to be on the screen. You can turn there if you want, but keep a finger at Revelation 9 because that's where we'll be. Note this, the Lord God of armies is about to remove from Jerusalem and from Judah every kind of security, the entire supply of bread and water, heroes and warriors, judges and prophets, fortune tellers and elders, commanders of 50 and dignitaries, counselors, cunning magicians and necromancers. I will make youths their leaders and unstable rulers will govern them. The people will oppress one another, man against man, neighbor against neighbor. The young will act arrogantly toward the old and the worthless toward the honorable. A man will even seize his brother in his father's house saying, you have a cloak, you be our leader. This heap of rubble will be under your control. On that day he will cry out saying, I'm not a healer. I don't even have food or clothing in my house. Don't make me the leader of the people. For Jerusalem has stumbled and Judah has fallen because they have spoken and acted against the Lord, defying his glorious presence. Defying. Remember that word, defiance. The look on their faces testifies against them. And like Sodom, they flaunt their sin. They do not conceal it. Woe to them, for they have brought disaster on themselves. Woe to them. They have brought disaster on themselves. Tell the righteous that it will go well for them, for they will eat the fruit of their labor. Woe to the wicked. It will go badly for them, for what they have done will be done to them. You see, God gave every chance, and they continued in disobedience, and he said, the inevitable result is this. Even the Israelites had done wrong, and God gave them a warning of what was to come because of their never-ceasing disobedience. In Revelation chapter 9, verses 1 through 12, we we see three consequences revealed in this last moment, this grunt moment, this sigh moment, this woe moment, this grunt of heaven describing what must happen what is the natural consequence of the disobedience of the kingdom at hand, this earthly kingdom toward God by the kingdom of this world and its inhabitants. Will you read with me Revelation chapter 9, 1 through 12. The fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from heaven to earth, the key for the shaft to the abyss, was given to him. He opened the shaft to the abyss, and smoke came up out of the shaft, like uh, or out of the great furnace, so that the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke from the shaft. Then locusts came out of the smoke onto the earth, and power was given to them, like the power that scorpions have on earth. 
They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only those people who do not have God's seal on their foreheads. They were not permitted to kill them, but were to torment them for five months. Their torment is like the torment caused by a scorpion when it stings someone. In those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. The appearance of the locusts, this is just horrifying, was like horses prepared for battle. Something like golden crowns was on their heads. Their faces were like human faces. Remember, it's all, <laughs> uh, it's all um, symbolism, so thank goodness. Can you imagine horse-sized human locusts? Yeah. They had hair like women's hair. The teeth were like lion's teeth. They had chests like iron breastplates. The sound of their wings was like the sound of many chariots with horses rushing into battle. And they had tails and stingers like scorpions so that with their tails they had the power to harm people for five months. They had as their king the angel of the abyss. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon and his Greek name is the name Apollyon, which just means destruction and destroy. The first woe has passed. There are still two more woes to come after this. It's this gut-wrenching moment to say this is the inevitable end to what you have done. And it's against the king of this earth and the king of this world, namely Satan and those who live their lives according to his ways. The first thing that we see here is that the destructive nature of the kingdom of this world, surprise, leads to destruction or receives destruction for itself. It's not a surprise that the destructive nature of the king of this world will receive destruction. The kingdom of this world has as its leader and king the one who inhabits the pit or the abyss in Isaiah 14, 12 through 15, we see who this is. I wanted you to see this in Isaiah chapter 14. Who is this? You'll, you'll read it and you'll know automatically who it is. And that's why I've already said his name. But would you put that on the screen? Isaiah 14, 12 through 15 says, Shining morning star, how you've fallen from the heavens. You destroyer of nations. You've been cut down to the ground. You said to yourself, I will ascend to the heavens. I will set up my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the God's assembly in the remotest parts of the north. I will ascend above the highest clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you will be brought down to Sheol into the deepest regions of the, of the pit or the abyss. It's the same word in both places. That is Satan. In this moment... Satan's release, Abaddon, Apollyon, his name is destruction. And that shouldn't surprise us because Peter says, be wary, be aware. He's a roaring lion seeking who may, who may devour. Elsewhere it says that he seeks to kill, steal, and destroy. Destruction is in his bones. And this is the foundation his kingdom is built upon. Destruction. And so it should be no surprise then when he is given the opportunity to come forward, it's under the name of Apollyon or Abaddon, which means destruction and, destru and to destroy. It should be not a surprise to us that his kingdom is characterized by destruction and that what awaits any who are not sealed and remain a part of that kingdom will receive Destruction. It shouldn't surprise us. We've talked about this all along. We've talked about these two opposing kingdoms. The kingdom of God, the true kingdom, the one that's been existent all along. But then this kingdom that was built around it, a shell of what Jesus offers, a, a mimic kingdom that Satan says, no, I'm trying to build my own throne. I'm trying to build my own way. I'm trying to build my own uh, kingdom so that I can be on high and be even higher than the most high. And when Jesus finally releases himself and his kingdom and comes into his glory. And we saw that earlier in Revelation chapter, uh, at Revel in the book of Revelation, we see that that kingdom just explodes the other one, that when Jesus' kingdom finally comes to fruition and is coming, as John indicates, it blows and obliterates the kingdom of destruction. And that's what is happening. 
in all of this. Destruction breeds destruction. And we have to be careful, we have to be careful that we don't hitch our trailer to this world and its ideals because they will ultimately lead to death and destruction. The second thing that we see, this is a really exciting uh, message and a real, I'm going to go home really encouraged today, Derek, right? It's a joke. It's, it's, it's hard. It's hard stuff. The second thing that we see is that the celebration of sinful rebellion will be destroyed. We live in a world that wants to celebrate sinfulness. We love rebellion and lift it high as a society. The warning here is that all of that will pass away. It is not lasting. It will be destroyed. Notice the ones who are spared from this torment and destruction that's about to be released are the ones that are a part of God's kingdom, sealed by him. The ones who said, no, I don't want to live according to this world. I don't want to hitch my trailer to that. I want to hitch my life to those ideals. I want to live my life for Christ, trusting in Christ, doing what we, we, we so visibly saw today in the baptistry waters to say, no, I am dying to myself. And so that Christ can raise me to new life. And when Jesus does that in our lives, he did that for me as a six-year-old boy on my knees with my granny who read a Bible uh, storybook to me. And I said, look, granny, I want to know that my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And she led me to believe in Jesus Christ as a six-year-old. In that moment, the Holy Spirit sealed me, protecting me from judgment to come, protecting me for so many moments, but for this moment as well. And friends, we must trust in Jesus and leave this world behind because it leads to destruction. Those who have trusted, trusted Jesus for salvation are sealed by the Holy Spirit and are reserved for glory. Where we're reserved for glory, not destruction. So the antithesis of this are those who have placed their trust in themselves or the king of this world and will suffer the natural consequences because of that. They've made a conscious choice. They were presented with an option that would lead to life and glory, and they chose the one that led to destruction. But as we have discussed, and this is where we do see hope, we do see encouragement. If Jesus continues to tarry in his return, then there is still a chance. If there's breath in our lungs, we have an opportunity to turn from the ways of this world and turn to Christ and find his loving arms and run from our sin and run to him. It's that picture of the Father mentioned in Luke 15 who sees his rebellious son a far way off and runs to him with open arms, saying, come home, come home. Friends, Jesus says the same thing to you today. Come to my loving arms. And he forgives our most egregious sins. The third thing that we see is that the toleration of evil will receive evil's torment. I was reading um, to prepare for this, and one of the authors I read said he didn't want to read verses 5 through 7, and I know why. It's just hard. But the thing that we see here is that evil tolerated leads to the torment of evil's kind. It's the natural consequence. It's like, what, what do people say? Don't play with snakes because you're going to get bit. It's the same idea. These terrifying horse-sized locusts with human faces and lion's teeth come to deliver the consequences for all who continue to embrace the kingdom of this world and its leader. What's their job? Just to torment for five months. Here's the thing. Torment awaits anyone not found in Christ in these moments. 
whether we want to believe it or not, torment is what awaits us. And so let's get out from under that and confess our sins and stop worshiping the world we live in. And what is the only thing that can protect us? The ones who were sealed were protected. There is a way to avoid the torment to come. And it's simply to trust Jesus. I already alluded to it a moment ago, but there is no greater example for us to see on the regular. We've seen it five weeks in a row. We've baptized five weeks in a row. Man, I hope we can make it six. That'd be amazing if God just works and moves and continues to work and move. But in that picture of baptism, what you see, we saw Devin today standing there, dead in her trespasses and sins. That's what it represents. And she died with Christ, was buried with Christ, and raised to life. And that's why we say that, buried in his likeness, raised to life in him. And when we trust in Jesus, we're raised to life. The old way is gone. The new way has come, and we are sealed for his glory. We celebrate another way as Christians. We do it once a month here. We do that so that we can remind ourselves again and again of this beautiful picture of what Christ has done. It's the Lord's Supper. It's communion. Just a moment, our deacons are going to come, and we're going to take communion today. Why do we do that? Why do we do it five, or why do we do it every month? Why do we do it the first week of every month? Why do we do that? To remind ourselves, Christ died for you, for me. His body was broken. His blood was spilled so that we could commune with his death. And in communing with his death, identifying with his death, we are saved and resurrected to new life, to a new covenant in him, a new promise to say, he will never leave us or forsake us. He will seal us and keep us and hold us. That's what that represents for you, for me. When we've trusted Christ as our Savior, what he did on the cross and his blood spilled for you and me saves us and gives us new life and a new promise that cannot be broken by anything. So I want to pray our deacons are going to come and as we take that cup take, and then we take that bread, take a moment to remember to confess your sins before the Lord and say, Lord, I'm sorry, forgive me. Because we don't want to take it lightly. But as we take those pieces, we remind ourselves of what he's done and how he's provided for us salvation. Lord, we love you. We praise you, God. We thank you for all you've done, for all you're going to do. Move in our hearts and our lives in this moment, God. Help us to remember and to see. Help us to trust you and to turn from the world and all that it has to offer us and turn to you and find life where we would have found death elsewhere. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This time, if my deacons will come, if you'll come and sit here, we're going to serve the Lord's Supper to remind ourselves of his sacrifice.
So we have uh, two cups, so make sure you get the bottom one there with the bread. And as we take this, it represents Jesus' body broken on the cross. Um, of course, he had no bones broken, but he was whipped and beaten for you and for me. And if we were to use um, um, matzah bread, it has holes and stripes. It was always a foreshadowing of what Jesus would endure to bring about sacrifice for you and for me. We take this in remembrance of him and what he did on the cross for us. So as you eat this, remember Jesus' body beaten and broken for you. Take and eat. While he was in the upper room with his disciples and they passed the cup, the cup often represents the pouring out of wrath. This cup, it's kind of like the bowl judgments we'll talk about in Revelation eventually. The pouring out of wrath. Well, the wrath of God was poured out on Jesus himself. And he says, this is my blood and the new covenant established by it. He established by the pouring out of his blood and receiving the wrath of God for sin for you and me. He received the judgment so you wouldn't have to. And that's why the sealed are sealed when the judgment to come comes. So Jesus bought that for you and me with his blood. So as we drink it, let's remember what he did as he spilled his blood for us. Take and drink. As we go today, let's remember that we go out not only as recipients of this love, but messengers to carry it with us. And my prayer is today, as we sing and have this moment of invitation and response, that if you are here and you need to do any kind of business with God, do that in this moment. If you need to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior today, please do that today. Don't wait. Don't wait. If you need to do any kind of other business with the Lord, you do that. I'd be here. I'd be glad to pray with you or lead you or guide you to whatever God may be showing you and telling you. So take this time, this moment, to respond to God in your own life. Let's pray, and we're going to sing. If you'll go ahead and stand, let's pray and sing. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for your love for us. Help us to carry it to others as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing together this morning. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. 
He gave me the look. I thought he was giving that announcement. It's all good. I'll let you guys know. So um, down front here, just a reminder, uh, grab some cards here uh, at the front, invitation cards. We have some invite cards in the back as well. Pastor Derek will have some back there. Um, but it is, it is really important. We want people to come back to worship with us because um, as the family of Christ followers here at Lafayette First, we want to grow that family. Amen. And so let's bring people with us, your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, whoever you might come into contact with you want to invite. I want to remind you as you leave, let's continue to worship through giving. You can do that here in the room in the boxes in the back, or you can text any dollar amount to 84321 and give that way as we worship the Lord by giving back to Him what He's entrusted to us. Hope that you'll remember to do that. This week, uh, as, as Derek said, we are ambassadors for him, that we are sent out into the world that we might share the story of his grace and truth with others. Let's not fall, fat on, fall flat on that this week. Some of us may fall fat. I do. But um, let's not fall flat, okay? So let's go out into the world. You are sent as ambassadors of Christ. Have a wonderful week. You are sent. Mm -hmm.